Good morning, 7th grade. It is Wednesday the 30th. We're doing Chapter 3, Section 4 today. I apologize for Monday. I had a meeting with our school insurance agent. Uh, we have to do one of those every year, and so I couldn't. Uh, I had to go down there during this hour. This is my hour off. Uh and tell them that I didn't want the insurance, which is weird because you don't go to McDonald's and tell them you don't want the Big Mac. Whatever. Uh, that's not my business. So this is your last section of notes for the first nine weeks. So that means tomorrow is Thursday. Make sure that you have clearly marked your name on the front of your notebook. And you need to bring that in. Now, uh, they're there from 2.45 to 5 tomorrow or during most of the day on Friday or Tuesday uh, until five. Okay, so one of those three days, you need to drop your notebook um, by so I can grade it, and then I will grade it as quickly as I can and have it back in the pile the next day. Uh, next Thursday, uh, we'll see how, what it, go, how it goes uh, between now and then. Uh, but I'd like to have them before next Thursday so I have a day or two to grade them all instead of running that right up against fall break. So once you've got these uh, completed, you should have chapter one, three sections, chapter two, four sections, and chapter three, four sections all written down uh, in, in order. And so make sure your name is on the front of that notebook and you turn it in. It's a 100-point grade. Uh, and so if you are, uh, if you get done with this section today and you write all these down, and you realize you're missing a section or two, that's okay. Get them down and get them in there in order and bring them tomorrow or Tuesday or Friday, okay? Uh, but don't neglect this and wait a whole nother eight days. Uh, so uh, don't forget also um, to make sure you're getting your study guides done. They have to be complete sentences. The essays have to be three to get credit. If you don't do sentences, you get a zero. Even if you just don't do a sentence on one, it's all or nothing. Uh, and most of you have either been doing that really well or not doing them at all. I still have people, tomorrow will be two weeks, 14 Earth days since the test. I have people that have not taken the test in seventh grade and eighth grade. You've got a zero. You're going to fail this nine weeks if you don't take your test and do your work. I really cannot explain any more simply. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be difficult. But if you're not doing your work, um, then I can't give you points. And this is uh, school for you. This is not something where you should be looking at each subject for 10 minutes and doing one little assignment and you're done for the day. You're supposed to be spending six hours a day on school, just like we are here. And so I know it's not easy when you're home to do this. My, my kids do this, their work at home. And when I get off school, I have to go work on the, that for two to three hours every afternoon with them. And it's not fun. I understand that. Uh, but it is what it is. You cannot get points and credit for not doing the work. Also, don't forget, your test is going to be a week from today on Wednesday. And don't forget, you have to label the 13 colonies on a map on that test. So make sure you start studying the map that I put on the Chapter 2, sorry, the Chapter 3, Section 2 uh, study guide. Okay? So we talked about the New England or the Northern colonies and then we talked about the middle colonies, which are duh, in the middle. And today we're talking about the southern colonies, which, as you can see there, I tried to be a smart aleck and put the colonies in the south. But you don't have to write that. You need to write chapter 3, section 4 at least. So uh, I don't know what's going on with my uh, background and you know, something different anyway. So the um, five southern colonies are Maryland, Virginia, the two Carolinas, which were just one Carolina at the beginning, and Georgia. Thousands begin to pour into these colonies, and these are different people from de very different walks of life. Some are indentured servants. Indentured servitude is basically a situation where you agree to become somebody's servant and uh, work for them for no pay in exchange for passage from whatever country you're coming from, most likely England to the New World, which is North and South America. And so a typical term would be seven years, which, man, I don't know. That's a pretty expensive boat ride, you know. You give up your life for seven years. And again, of course, that's negotiable. Sometimes it could be four years. Sometimes it could be longer. Um, but 
the idea is you work basically as a servant for this person, uh, you know, a slight step above a slave, but still not a fun job by any uh, stretch of the imagination for that certain period of time. And then once your terms, the, the length of your contract is up, you are now a free person. But then again, if you start thinking of the logistics of that, if you've been in a new place for seven years and you've really done nothing else other than uh, work for this person, I'm not sure what job prospects or skills you're going to obtain. And I don't, I mean, a lot of these people experience very hard lives even after they were set free. And a lot of people just stayed on as servants for reasons you could probably understand. A lot of times it's easier to continue doing what you know, even if you don't love it, just because you feel safe in that and you feel secure, you know. So we'll start by talking about Maryland. Maryland uh, was a proprietary colony. Propri and again, the three types of colonies are royal, charter, and proprietary. Royal is what it sounds like. It's run by the king or queen. Proprietary is something that's given uh, by usually the king to an owner. Okay, you've probably seen the word proprietor a lot of times in your life, even if you may not realize or remember it. They're on a lot of restaurant windows. You'd be like a Bob's Burger Barn or whatever. And then it'll say like Bob Smith proprietor underneath that. That means the owner. And so George Calvert was the proprietor or owner of the colony of what we now call uh, Maryland or what they I mean, they started calling Maryland back then. OK, and so he, George, dies and his son, Cecilius, not a name you hear much anymore, but maybe maybe you have somebody that you know named Cecil or Cecilius or Cecil. Um, they called it Maryland and, you know, there was uh, there's some uh, disagreement over whether it was named after the, you know, current or former Queen of England, Queen Mary or the Virgin Mary from the Bible. In reality, it doesn't matter. It's called Maryland. Maryland, either way. The reason Maryland was created was to provide a safe haven for Catholics. And so we've got a lot of the same situations that we talked about back in section one when we discussed the pilgrims. You've got different people in different spots that will only allow you to worship in certain ways. And so a lot of people are leaving where they are because they are Catholic or because they're Calvinist instead of Lutherans or their Puritans instead of separatists and where they are currently staying, those people aren't welcome or not treated well there. And so they want to go somewhere where people will get off their back. You're a seventh grader. You have probably felt this. You want to, you know, I'm going to go to your room and I just don't want anybody to talk to me right now. That happens a lot. People who want to be left alone to do what they feel like for a little while. Sometimes that happens to everybody. I'm 40. Sometimes I do that. I go to my room lock my kids out. Uh, so uh, Maryland was created mostly as a uh, safe place for Catholics. They grew tobacco out the wazoo. Uh, and again, tobacco, uh, I can't, I wish I could uh, tell you like it was terrible and ruined everything because it's bad for you. You know, tobacco is, uh, you, you know, my grandpa died from lung cancer. My dad, my whole life smoked, uh, but it's not good for you. Uh, but it really was a moneymaker for a lot of these colonies back in the day. Uh, the biggest city in Maryland was Baltimore. It, it, created, it had a good seaport, which, again, uh, if you have found a common theme, we're talking about New Amsterdam, which later became New York, or Baltimore or any of these other big cities, that's the common theme they have is they're on a waterway, whether that's a river or more commonly, excuse me, in our case, the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, that boats, boats could – boach, what's a boat? Uh, boats could reach easily, uh, which um, is the reason that they grew. That was pretty much the main thing back then. Access to get things in and out is what's going to make your big cities because shipping has to be done on a ship, which is where it got its name. So uh, basically Maryland and Pennsylvania to the north constantly disagree over like where the border is, you know, like you're fighting with your brother or sister that you share a room with and you get the duct tape and you put it on the middle of the room and you're like, you don't go on my side of the room and I won't go on your side of the room. And then you like guys are getting out tape measures and be like, well, yours, you got an inch more to the side. I should have more, you know, that's basically what Maryland and, and uh, Pennsylvania were doing in most 
places in the eastern part of the United States on the east side. And if you want to pull up a map on your own time, you can you can look at this. In most places east of the Mississippi River, you have natural borders. And so there weren't a lot of arguments over these. OK, um, you know, you have rivers or mountain ranges or streams or whatever. Rivers are most most common that create a border between states. You live in Illinois. If you go west to Missouri, the western border of Illinois is the Mississippi River, of course. If you're going south to Paducah to Chuck E. Cheese, that's the Ohio River that you're crossing. That creates that border. And so in a lot of cases, they are naturally settled. This is going to be the border, and the river is not going to move, and so that's pretty much settled. But the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania is a survey border or a man-made border. Uh, and this is more like your yards, okay? You and your neighbor have a yard, and you've got to have surveyors that say where one property begins and the other one ends, which is pretty low stakes and pretty easy when it's just you and your neighbor in a yard, uh, but when you're talking about two of the original 13 colonies and two of the 15 states now, it becomes a bigger deal. And so these two uh, uh, astronomers, their last names are Mason and Dixon, uh, they are hired in 1767. Well, they're hired before then. It takes a while. But they read the paperwork and the, and the contract, and they basically just walk across the entire border. And what they do is they put stones one with the Penn family crest, you know, a crest uh, like in uh, Game of Thrones or Harry Potter where you have like this thing in front of the shield and it's got four sections, it's got like a lion at the top more like, ah, and then like a bunch of crosses and then, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and then the Calvert family crest, which is became the Maryland flag, which is uh, probably one of the most famous flags, state flags in America. Uh, they love it and uh, it's hideous. Uh, it might, I, it's a matter of opinion. You might Google it in a little bit. And like, I love the Maryland State Flag, but they put it on everything. Uh, they put their football team, the Maryland College football team, puts it on their helmets. It's like it's a crest with four different sections, and then like one diagonal is red and white, and the other one's yellow and black, and it clashes, and your eyes cross as soon as you see it. Um, they love it there. They put it on everything, but you know, it's just a matter of taste. You might like it, uh, but I think it's hideous. But you know, we can agree to disagree if you want. Uh, so Maryland's assembly becomes Protestant and they make the Anglican church, the official church of Maryland, which if you remember from literally one slide ago, maybe two, my brain's mush, so I don't know. Uh, they were created as a safe place for Catholics. So in the beginning, uh, all the Catholics went there to be like, hey, we can worship here as we want. And now the, the uh, assembly's coming in like, hey, no Catholics. So all the Catholics are like, hey, now what? And so that's going to create problems. You can still see some of these stones, by the way. You can, you can, uh, there's, I mean, not from your house, but if you live near Pennsylvania, Maryland, or go there on a vacation trip, uh, some of these stones are still, uh, still in the spot that they're created. You can see the, the stones with crest on one side and the other crest on the other that created the border between, uh, uh, the Mason Dixon line. The Mason Dixon line is considered to be basically the, the beginning of the South. This is considered to be the border between the North and the South in the uh, eastern part of the United States. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily recommend taking a vacation to go look at a few rocks, but if you do what you do. Uh, so anyway, yeah, there you can see it. Now you can see, like I said, the differences in the border. You get these curvy lines. You know, if you had to describe the, the shape of the state of like Illinois, you would say like a uh, puddle of vomit. Uh, you know, there's no real shape there. But, you know, these are straight lines. When you look out west, like at Colorado, they're rectangles. And that's because men, uh, humans, people, created those borders. So uh, people in West Virginia, Western Virginia, not West Virginia, West Virginia doesn't become a state until the 1800s. There's no such thing as West Virginia. This is the western part of the state of Virginia. Um, they want to expand west, but they're being attacked by Native Americans. And so they uh, send a letter to the governor like, hey, we're trying to move west, but Native Americans keep attacking. And the governor sends a, uh, uh, a letter back to them like, we'll stop. Stop trying to take their land and they'll stop attacking you. And they're like, well, no, uh, you know, it's like going to a doctor and like my it hurts when I do this. And like, well, don't do this, you know. And so um, so Bacon got upset. They are like, hey, we're going to take this land, whether you allow it or not. And so they start attacking Native American villages. They marched to Jamestown and burned the Capitol building down. 
Uh, and this was a very important event in early American history because it basically showed that the American thirst for land was not going to be stopped by just somebody saying like, hey, no. And it also goes to show that we've got a lot of conflict with Native Americans coming up and we're going to keep uh, intruding into their land and just taking things in a lot of instances. And that's going to create a lot of conflict. Uh, and so this basically says what I just said. It showed that um, we're not going to be held back and that America, American growth is uh, inevitable. Inevitable means unavoidable. Uh, so I won't spend time on this. We'll go on. So, and again, I'll attach these. You could write these down at your own pace. I know that I'm not going to spend enough time on every slide for you to write these down. So uh, King Charles II, Chucky II, as uh, we like to call him, creates another proprietary colony, Carolina. And again, uh, these people have differing skills at farming and whatever, but they all are good at uh, kissing up to the king. And so they named the biggest city in southern part of Carolina, Charlestown, after Charles. Uh, the northern part of Carolina is not as successful. South Carolina has better beaches to get boats in and out of the ocean, has better farmland. It stays wet to be able to grow rice. I'm not a farmer, obviously, or I wouldn't be here talking to you. But if you've ever seen rice being farmed and harvested, it, like it's in like shin high water that they've got to just basically keep it for the plants to grow uh, regularly. And so basically the northern part of Carolina struggles. They can't really grow uh, as wide of a variety of, of crops as quickly. Um, they have rocky, cliffy uh, coastline instead of rolling beaches to get boats in and out. And so they struggle. Those are two very important things at the time. It's not like 2020 where like we can make a shoe factory or we can, you know, start producing computers. You know, basically agriculture, what you can and can't grow is really uh, what natural resources are there really limits the economy of those areas. Uh, so they split up uh, pretty soon. They become North Carolina, of course, and South Carolina, which still uh, stands today. Growing rice is very labor intensive. And so this is the first um, really uh, instance in America of an economy becoming entirely based around the work of slave labor. Uh, and again, you know, this is going to become a recurring theme throughout the next two years in America, we've relied a lot on slave labor in a lot of instances where, uh, you know, people just don't want to don't want to do the work. And, you know, you have a situation where you could buy someone for life and get free labor. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that people did it is still, you know, a lot of rest of the world has already started uh, moving away from slave labor. You know, I don't want anybody to get the idea that we're the only country that did this. We're definitely not. Um, but we were late to the game to stop it. And, you know, the idea that, well, you you know, owning a slave is a moral, um, you know, whether or not it's okay to own another human and treat a person like that is a moral question that, like, my six-year-old could easily figure out. And so the idea that these adults just didn't know better back then is not, doesn't really wash out. You can, uh, you know, pretty much figure out that, hey, this is wrong without much thought. But, you know. They're like, well, this may be wrong, but I'm making a lot of money. So uh, the second most uh, uh, profitable crop is indigo. They use it to make dye to color clothes, which was a big deal back then. Georgia was the last of the British colonies to be created. They were created. Uh, they were a charter colony. A guy gave a, was given a contract. His name was James Oglethorpe. Uh, and so the, there were basically two reasons that uh, Georgia was created. The first one is Spain owned Florida. England owned South Carolina, and this would create a buffer zone or a border in between them to where they couldn't just constantly be at war. They would have to march all the way through Georgia and word would get out and, and then South Carolina could prepare. Because like we've talked about in the last couple sections, that was a thing that you could just do. You could just take the land that you wanted, you know. Uh, and so the second reason it was created was for um, basically they were if people owed money, they were just throwing them in prison left and right. And the prisons were becoming overcrowded. And so uh, it became basically a debtor's colony. Basically, instead of uh, sending people to prison that owed money, they just were like, hey, go to Georgia, live your life. This is also incidentally how the whole country of Australia was created, which is why they've got those accents that sound pretty similar to British uh, accents although not exactly the same. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to try to do the difference because I'm terrible at accents, but anyway. Um, so uh, 
Georgia banned slaves and banned Catholics and banned ROM, you know, two out of three, uh, you know, you've got a little religious, a lot of religious discrimination there. So it's not uh, bad. And so people got upset. And I got to tell you, they're not upset really over the Catholic thing, which is the most offensive thing there. They got upset that they weren't allowed to have booze and slaves. And so uh, he basically were like, all right, uh, you guys want to have booze and slaves? I quit. Uh, you, the king can have this back and I'm leaving. And he did. And so it became a royal colony again. Uh, and so there's your 13 colonies. You've got Georgia, the two Carolinas, uh, north and south. Uh, you've got Virginia and Maryland today. Those are your five southern colonies. We talked about the New England colonies two sections ago, which would be Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. And then you got the four middle colonies that we talked about uh, two days ago, which would be, uh, oh boy, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, and uh, which one did I forget? New Jersey. There we go. There's all 13. So make sure that you remember those two and where to put them on a map. Make sure you study. Make sure you're wearing your mask. You're out, washing your hands and all that good stuff. Uh, again, I apologize for uh, the lack of video on Monday, although you're probably fine with it. You just have to write the notes down instead of doing both. Uh, but it makes me feel bad because I don't feel like I'm doing enough. But uh, so, oh, attendance question. Uh, I'm writing down. People like, people like doing contests, it seems. So I'm writing down a number. On a piece of paper right there, between 1 and 100. All you got to do is guess a number between 1 and 100. And I will tell you on the next video, which is going to be a few weeks, by the way, because we got fall break before we start Chapter 4. If you'll remind me, I'll tell you who was the closest guesser. Okay? Or we might do a review video uh, on YouTube on Friday for the test or something. We'll see. I'm not exactly sure what's coming up soon. But I do know you're going to have a test on Wednesday. I do know you're going to finish your notes today. Uh, and you're going to start turning those in tomorrow in in the old gym lobby and you're going to uh turn in your study guides either as you get them done or all before the test on wednesday on google classroom so those are your tasks to get done for social studies make sure you stay on top of your other classes too and uh you guys have a good rest of the day and i will possibly well not see you but you'll possibly see me on friday okay have a good